regarding the script, because it was a, it was a, it's a really powerful script. Uh, t- tell us the journey. Like, how did it come to be? Who who approached you? And I think whoever read that script afterwards, they were really drawn to it. You mean with the actors? And yeah, yeah. yeah. Did, I mean, it would go even a bit back. Um, after we did Romans 12, 20, someone yeah. approached you to write the script. Yeah, well, I had the intuition to write it. And then I said to my agent, Debbie, uh, can you find me somebody that will produce this? I said, I'm going to do it with Paul and Ludwig. Um, but can you find me someone to produce it? Perhaps they can put some money into it. And she got me in touch with James Harris uh, from the tea shop uh, film company. And I met him. And normally it's like getting blood out of a stone to get anything from a producer. But I said to him, I've got this idea. It's based on this. I said, there's only one caveat. And that is that it's the same directors. And they said, that's okay. We like their work. Um, I said, have you got some money? He says, yeah. And I said, oh, okay. So yeah, that's, that's <laughs> he gave me, I said, pardon? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, we've got a little bit of money. I haven't got loads, but we can pay you something to write the first draft. So I just wrote the first draft. I didn't want notes. I didn't want direction. I knew what wanted to come out. And then afterwards, then you and Ludwig came in and helped me to expand it. Um, and we got, we gave it to James um, and to Ronnie, who was his co-producer. And James looked, read it and said straight away, we want to go A-list with this. So we started to go out to A-list actors through a casting agent. And we originally, if you remember rightly, Daniel Craig wanted to do it. Yes. And, Ra- and he wanted to know whether we'd let Rachel White Weiss yes. play. And the- film it and film it in New York. And film it in New York. And uh, we said yes. And he said, look, I'm filming stuff. Can you wait for me? And we waited a year for him, didn't we? And then after a year, he, he kind of backed out. Yeah. But he was really good because he said, uh, I'm going to put this in front of my agent. I'm going to put it in front of everybody I know. He said, I can't do this now. My window's closed, but I'll put it in front of other people. And that followed on. Casting agent said, it might seem unlikely, but what do you think about Orlando Bloom? Why don't we try Orlando Bloom? Um, and I said, it sounds great. And uh, so we give it to Orlando Bloom. And uh, he was very nervous of it, wasn't he? But he was yep. brave. He took it on because he, he, you know, because I know his agent at the time was telling him not to do it. It was a well, mistake. It, I think it, it was his um, manager or publicist. Yeah, I think it was because the yeah. agents really the liked agent it. liked it. it was the his agents, manager yeah. or publicist. Yeah, because we we, we talked with the agents. Um, afterwards after the film was made and they said yeah. that we don't normally get scripts like this it's yeah. usually one after the other but this one boom it jumped out yeah it jumped out so we had to and 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 just to go back the reason why they wanted a an a-list they wanted a someone who had gone the art route then made a made it made a big film and then now they're looking for projects to sink yeah. their teeth into to act wanted so that's somebody, why they wanted somebody that was you know that's wanted... why they went daniel craig yeah I remember, well, I hope Paul Lander doesn't mind me sharing this, but he said, I want to do something. He said, look at Tom Hardy. He said, I went to, mm. I went to acting school with Tom Hardy. He said, I want to do something like Tom's doing. And Tom was doing really challenging films. That's what I love about Orlando. He, I know this really challenged him. I know he struggled with it and he did an amazing job. But he wanted to do something that challenged him. He wanted to do something that brought out his own stuff. It was, I won't go into details, but he wanted to bring whatever he, need, whatever he needed to individuate. This brought out something in everybody. That was the whole idea. Everybody thinks they're making films. They're not making films. We're cleaning. We know, we're, we're going in and we're cleaning out the stuff so we can get beyond the parasite and get to the light. So my job as a, um, as a soul is to, is, if I can align myself, is to bring light into the world. Light is knowledge or light is consciousness and consciousness is the fuel for the tabernacle. This is the tabernacle. The tabernacle is the, is the uh, transportable vessel that carries God. In the very center of me and all of us is a Kaaba, a little hat that what the, the, in, in uh, Islam they call it the house of God. And in the corner of the Kaaba is the soul. And that's the building place. That's the building place for the temple, God's temple. So I need to locate that and start to build it. I can't locate it. I can't get that light into me when there's so many blocks. I had so many blocks. Because my being abused and coming from a, um, from, you know, like a working class background where, where, your, you know, where your perceptions are quite small, you know, work in a factory, retire at 60 and all that kind of thing. 
I had lots of perceptions that needed to be, uh, that, that fed lots of ambitions, and lots of need for validation, lots of need for people to like my work. So I had to clear all that, I had to get rid of all of that stuff over a period of time, because all of that blocks light. All of those are small perceptions, the need to make a lot of money, the need to be validated, the need to be famous, the need to win awards, the need for people to like you, the need for people to um, uh, acknowledge you. It's all nonsense. But that was very real to me. They were, they were the perceptions that, that my parasite fed from. So over a period of time, I was led to um, dissolve those perceptions, break them down into their component parts and empower bigger perceptions. So the moment you remove an ignorance or an old perception, a new perception comes in and you just suddenly see more. So instead of just seeing this tiny little bit here, I can see the whole table. Instead of seeing the whole table, I can see the whole room. And how did you feel after the, seeing the film, the finished product? Um, everything about that film was painful, <laughs> yeah. but also beautiful because I'm where I am now because of it. I mean, you know, you look at me now, my mum says to me, you're too skinny, you're too skinny, get down that doctor's. Um, because all of the weight I was carrying, all the muscle, all the fat I was carrying, I was up about 16 stone at one point, was all of the stuff that was feeding the parasite. I was a greedy with my food, I was greedy with my ambition, I was greedy with making money, I was greedy with the need for validation, that's gone. I'm not saying it's not a threat, I'm, it, it's always trying to get back in. But when I removed that, my body shrank. So as my consciousness expanded, my body physically shrank. I didn't need all that armor. I'm not, you know, I'm not bothered about what I eat. I'm bothered about what I'm feeding. What am I feeding? So all this ambition I had, all this need for validation was feeding the parasite. When I got rid of the parasite, you know, the, the lion starves, as they say, for want of prey. So I contracted in physically and expanded in consciousness. As I expanded in consciousness, I was just able to see more. So I was thinking, I don't need to worry about me, you know, the personality Jeff Thompson, um, and about whether I'm validated. I don't even need to worry about, you know, my family or my house, or I don't really particularly need to worry about the planet. I need to be thinking much bigger than that. This planet, if you, if I was taken out of my body the other day in meditation. I was taken out of my body and I was placed in space. And I was placed in this part in space where I was able to put my thumb out and block out the whole of the earth. And then it was removed a bit further back till the earth was just a seed. And then a bit further back until the earth disappeared. And he's saying to me, you've got to think bigger than the earth, bigger than the planet. This planet, what you and what you do on this planet affects the universe, affects the cosmos. So we've got to start thinking, that's perception. Perception is about going, I'm not trying to fix um, an, an insoluble world. I'm trying to... I'm trying to have an effect on the whole universe because everything affects everything. So it's kind of saying, forget about these small stories. Forget about your class, your colour, you know, uh, your culture, you know, your wound. Forget about that. Just use that as a tracer. They're good. If my story is, is if, I've got a, if I've got a painful story, that's, that story is, is the cross that marks where the treasure is. I can follow that story back until I reach what it's covering up, which is my light. Once I open the light, which is what we call waking up, that light can start to gradually expand and all that dissolves. Then I start to ask myself, not how can I serve me or how can I serve my family or how can I serve mankind? It's too small. How can I serve God? God is omniscient, he's omnipotent, he's omnipresent. So if I ask, how can I serve you? then I'm serving everything else as well. It's not that these things aren't important. You know, it's just that we can get past them. So these blockages stop light from coming in. So if I can remove those blockages, if I can remove the whole, you know, what's in this for me, you know, what, um, how's this going to serve me? If I can remove selfishness and replace it with selflessness, then I've got an expanded consciousness. And in the Zohar, in the Judaic tree of life, they, you know, this is the, um, they call it the lurking variable, the hidden variable. The secret to perpetual motion, the secret to abundance is to stop thinking about yourself. It's too small and it blocks light. 
And if you do get light, you can, it's going to come in and it's going to be, uh, it's going to leak everywhere. This is about recognizing that if I can, if I can genuinely find a place of wanting to serve God, wanting to serve everybody through God, um, then I'm in a place where I'm going to receive light. I'm going to conserve light. I'm going to train light and expand it and deepen it and into all of its detail until it's till this abstract idea becomes an articulated certainty. And then I'm going to put that out into the world. I'm going to impose it on the world. Whether I impose that, you know, um, through my martial art as a single punch, or whether I impose that through a book, or you know, I'll, I'll impose it wherever God asks me to impose it through a film, through, through a film, which is what we were talking Romans about. Retaliation. So all the all the early stuff, all the films, that was not about me trying to make a living. Although that might have been on my mind, it was about me Expressing individuating yourself. all of this stuff, cleaning. It's just about cleaning. It was about removing everything, all the layers, so that I could look at them and go to the light, find the light, find the unwounded part, find the part that has not been soiled. And then once you find that, that becomes your teacher. So that goes, oh, here we are. We woke up and we, we're with Jeff. This is where he is. And other people, I guess, who watch the film, they get what they get from it. They get whatever they need from it, yeah. And what did the film go on to do? Um, went to Edinburgh. I went to Edinburgh. We were in Edinburgh. Won. I think um, Anne Reid won Best yeah. Actor at Edinburgh. It was nominated for Best Film. Yeah. And it kind of got a release all around the world. And, it, and I know Orlando got... The best reviews of his life. It was on. He was on the Ellen DeGeneres show. He was on all sorts of massive shows in America, to, and he was. The Golden Globes took an interest as well at one point. Yeah, the Golden Globes yeah. took took an interest. Obviously, it's a very controversial film, but it went and did the work it needs to do. Sometimes it was loud, like Ellen DeGeneres, and sometimes it was very quiet, where it touched pe- individual people at individual screenings. You know, yes, um, in, yeah, yeah. In, in Edinburgh, in kind of faraway places that you, you know, that you mm. would never even imagine. I, I don't. I think I told you the story about how Rory was in yes. Europe. What um, at a, I think it was at a funeral. Rory was one of the actors in the film, and he said he was walking down the street, and he said he saw that Romans because he's, he's him, in the film. He's in the film. He was on at the local cinema, and he went into the cinema. And he said to the he said to the people in there, he said, I'm in this film. Um, I just want, you know, I'm, I'm in town. And they said, well, we're only launching it tonight. Do you want to come and introduce it? So Rory, because he's a great actor, he introduced the film. But he said he took his girlfriend's family with him and they come and sat and watched it as well. And he said afterwards, and this is the power of the film. This is how the film works. And I hope I'm redaying this right for Rory. Um, and he said afterwards, him, him and his girlfriend, their family were sat round at a dinner table discussing the film. And the mother of one of uh, the cousins said, yeah, you know, it's a strong film and all the rest of it, but I don't believe it. I don't believe that goes on in the priesthood. I don't believe there is abuse like that in the priesthood. I, I just think it's exaggerated. And, and suddenly, we're, he said, I heard a voice from the other side of the table and it was this woman's son. And she said, he, he said, mom. And she said, yeah. And he says, do you remember when I was depressed? And she said, yeah. And she said, and you sent me to a priest. She said, she said yeah. And he said, he sexually abused me. And his girlfriend went, <gasps> and everyone in the room went quiet. And that was the first time he'd ever spoken to anybody about it. So the film was the intercessor. The film was the intercessor. Life. When we were at Edinburgh, I met two people who I would say were angels. That they were manifestations of angels, angelic um, guidance and they both told me what the film was they spoke to me I was taken away from them quite quickly because we were so busy and I only had a minute with them it was only afterwards that I realised but one of them said do you know what your film is and I told him what we thought it was and he said it's an intercessor it's in the intercessor in the, in the Christian testament is the, and the Old Testament is the Holy Dove it's like the voice of God. The Holy Dove is seen as the third person in the Trinity. So you've got God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. So it's like a permeation of God. It's an attribute of God. And he said, your film acts as an intercessor. And once he told me act as an intercessor, I realised that everything I do acts as an intercessor. But only if it's honest. Yeah, that's what I was about to say, because it's got truth in it. And people yeah. relate to truth. If it hasn't got truth in it, and how many people tried to stop us from bringing the truth out. 
the financer a lot, yeah. wanted to take the vital scene in the film out. The, uh, the, um, loads of the people promoting the film wanted to take out other certain scenes. And these were the pivotal scenes. The one scene, the pivotal scene is the handshake scene. Yeah, that's why we made the film. Credit to Orlando when he played that scene. It, he, he did it in a way that he was forgiving him against all his yeah. will, against all his yeah. wishes, which made that yeah. scene really worth it. Yeah. Because, because it wasn't... Um, it wasn't like this, uh, okay, you forgive and everything's okay. Yeah. You know, but something was driving him to do that. Yeah, and well, that it, forgiveness is, forgiveness is, is, is the acknowledgement that I haven't got the power to pardon this person. That's, that's, that's knowledge, that's law. <clears throat> but I trust that reciprocity will level the hills and fill the valleys. So reciprocity is, is an impeccable force that will uh, call in all of its credits and debts. So <clears throat> that's trusting that, Reciprocity will look after this, which he does in the film, and it's also saying that uh, this isn't the end. This isn't the end of my journey. I've got like I I forgave the person that abused me, but I'd got thirty years worth of abuse in my body still. There was still shit in the plumbing, so I had to process all that, all of the damage I'd done, all the violence I'd inflicted on other people. So I had to clean that as well. That's all in the plumbing, and that's where my writing. The reason my writing has been so prolific is because. That's me bringing it out, exposing it to light, and not just exposing it to light, but it becoming a light. In other words, if you read that truth, that becomes a light, it becomes spirit. And that spirit enters you, you feel inspired. Maybe you feel intimidated, maybe you feel ruffled. Lots of people who are reading the 99 Reasons to, for to Forgive at the moment said it's really been very hard for them to read it because it's brought up lots of stuff they need to look at. But also what was different in Romans to the short film was at the end of uh, Romans 12, 20, the short, he forgave. And the way that it kind of ended was now he's better. But what yeah. we did it with Romans uh, retaliation was we weren't just showing, OK, now you're forgiven. This is the hard work this for you. This is where the work starts. But yeah. we also looked at it from the perspective of the person who abused and his story and the people around him and the family mm. around him that have to deal with that news. We wanted to avoid saying, okay, forgive and everything's okay. Yeah. And we were, I, I can't remember who came up with the idea of um, have a, a child witness something. The child is always a representation of the soul. Um, and it, and, it, and the, the whole idea in the script and, um, and in the film is that we see, we see the priest, uh, careful about giving away spoilers if people haven't watched it, but I think people know the story, but because they've seen Romans 12, 20, but the priest burns himself in the field. But as he does it, he takes off all of his holy garments. He takes off his cross and he throws it on the floor. And in the script, his niece picks the cross up and looks at it. And then we recognize that she now has to carry his cross. Our family have to carry our cross. If we don't um, atone for ourselves, if we don't redress, and um, uh, if we don't, if we don't clean our own sins, they, are, they have to be picked up by our family. Of course, my kids, my, uh, my mum, my dad, everyone's going to be affected by what I do if I don't clean it myself. So, we, so our family inherit it. So we do the work we can so they don't have to. But because this guy didn't do the work, he left it to his family. So it's kind of saying, it doesn't end there. Just because the priest kills himself doesn't mean he's free. Yeah, and people, That's and, still got to be picked up. And people aren't glad at the end as well that was no. a key thing for us is to say that i'm sure there's going to be people saying oh he deserved it but if you put that message in in, in there that it's not just him there's other Everybody's innocent affected, people around yeah. everything affects um, everything and that was one the one scene that someone i don't, I don't remember in the screening yeah um, in a, edinburgh a woman said why did you put me through this and yeah. not give me that relief at the end yeah and what she was really saying was because she's saying why would you do this to me you know because we we showed that we showed the girl witnessing the guy from a distance setting himself on fire, although she doesn't know it's her uncle at the time. But and the, one of the journalists at Edinburgh said, "Why would you do this to me?" But what she was really saying is, "Why? Why would you? Why would you make me look at the fact that what I do, how I live, what I think about, what I say, and what I do affects my child? Why would you do that to me?" That, but that's truth. I said, "I'm just showing reciprocity." So people don't want to realise that everything we do affects everybody. 
I wish you articulated it <laughs> as you did back then because we put it in there as a feeling yeah. and we thought people were going to get it. And when she asked that question, I was yeah. kind of sort of... I, I don't, I but don't, I didn't know until... I didn't know until, until she asked it. Until she asked. The good thing about a film like this is a lot of the stuff you don't understand until you've shared it and then people ask you and then you tell them what it means not realising that you didn't know what it mm. meant until the film came out. Most of the stuff in that film I didn't understand until afterwards. You had the feeling of it, but I couldn't articulate it. Yeah, but you can't mm. articulate it. That's what they say about God. God visits, but you don't know he's there. You only know mm. after he's gone. So God visited me when I wrote that film. And I didn't know I didn't know what God was saying or even that he'd been there until afterwards. Well, it was good she challenged us because it got us talking about it. Yeah. Afterwards, we were saying, yeah, what? yeah we put it in there, but let's articulate it. You, like can't, you can't know it before. You can't have three before three has occurred. You know, you can't know that stuff. That's the idea that the, fi the film itself is a seed. And when you put it out in front of the public and they ask questions and they scrutinise, that seed starts to grow. And then you get to understand, you know, you get to understand what you know by sharing what you know with others. So it's the film itself is a seed and it's still expanding mm -hmm. and it will continue to expand. And it's doing work in the world that we don't even know about. We don't have to know about it. It's, we just need to tell the truth. And then the, the truth is a spirit. There's a spirit in the film. It isn't like, um, it's not a metaphor. You know, it's an actual spirit. There's, you know, you're giving birth to a spirit when you're telling truth. And that spirit goes out. And if you feel inspired or if you feel shaken by it, maybe it makes you tremble. Maybe like that woman was very upset. That's the spirit working in you. That's the spirit going inside you and starting to work on whatever it is you need to work on so that more light can come in. Some people will be inspired in a, in, you know, in that it makes them high. And in other people, they will be inspired in, in that it will, it will make them tremble because they'll think, you know, I've been so busy looking at what other people have done to me. I'm not looking at what I've done to other people. People, mm -hmm. people are killing every day. People sit outside Costa, um, you know, assassinating their friends, their character, with talk. Now, if you go into the Zohar, which is the, 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 the hidden Bible, it's the exegesis of the Torah, the Old Testament, they consider gossip to be murder. They don't, you know, they're not, they're looking at it metaphysically. They're saying when you assassinate somebody else's character, that's, they could consider it murder. You're attacking their spirit. When you embarrass somebody, you know, for your own gain and you, and, and they flush with embarrassment, you're drawing blood. You're drawing blood from one part of the body to the other. So most people don't really want to know that what they think and what they say and what they do affects other people. But if we want to grow and expand and, and, be available to more light. We have to, we have to be prepared to look at that. That's why uh, Aeschylus, the Greek philosopher said, those that learn suffer. Because we suddenly expand and go, I can't believe how unkind I've been. I can't believe how greedy I've been. I can't believe that. I can't believe how duplicitous everything I do is. But once you see it, then you can start, you can start changing that. And you can, by piecemeal, you can stop feeding the parasite and start feeding the paraclete. The paraclete is the Holy Spirit. So we don't feed the parasite. We don't give it the vices and all the, the negative stuff that, you know, that we do, most people do every single day. But we feed, the, we feed the paraclete. The paraclete is the Holy Dove. And that's a real energy. It's a real spirit. And we feed that by having conversations like this, by making films with truth. By being kind to the person we wake up with in the morning, to being um, uh, non-judgmental, because we don't know anything. How can I judge anybody else when I don't know anything about them? How can I judge somebody on, on, a, on a fragment of what I see on the news? This is about, this is about feeding the, para, the paraclete by reading scriptures, not just the revealed Bibles, but the hidden Bibles, not just the binary Bibles, which is you know, answers and questions or whatever, but the quantum Bibles, which, which you go into and have a specific message for you that in, within, within the hidden realm of the Bible, nothing to do with normal stories and you know, normal parables and metaphors and symbols, but a proper message in there. And so we, we can access light all the time as long as we're prepared to receive the light, um, conserve the light, train the light, develop the light, impose the light into the world. 
I think that's you, what yeah. you become. And you have to be aware of what you're doing and you have to want to do it for a reason to get better. That's the hidden you variable. Know, I think that's the difficult... Yeah. And, it, and yeah. there was, like, you, you were talking about gossiping and one of the ways that I address that was I said to myself if there was a tape recorder here yeah. recording what I'm saying but I want I, it passed on to that person yeah. and that was a way of me um, realising you know what we say mm. and, and and our actions how, how different and they metaphysically that's true metaphysically everything is recorded and have a guess mm. where it's recorded in us and in, because mm. it's recorded in us and the macrocosm and the microcosm are joined it's recorded everywhere that's what the, in the in the Old Testament in the um Holy Quran, um, it says that, you know, after you leave this physical body, you'll be in a room and there'll be two queues and the long queue will be of ex- full of excuse makers. He said, and you won't be able to lie because even your skin will speak a testimony against you. Don't be in the long queue. That brings us on to pyramid text. Yeah. Yeah.